I don't think it's beneficial for artists to work in their house. I just think that you need it. If you're a professional artist, you should have a, a studio space. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest, Sarah Brooks Sandin. She is a serial entrepreneur here in Savannah, an LA native. Uh, she's an artist, she's an entrepreneur, and she is a multifaceted, very interested character. She's also the, the one of the owners of The Stables, which is where the podcast studio is located. And this will be the last episode in this studio space. Oh, Mo that's cool. Moving on up, yeah. So um, to open up the episode, tell mm -hmm. the listeners a little bit about where you're from, and what you do, because it's because you do so much. It's not like, you know, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm just I'm this. Kinda... I know it's so hard to explain. Um, hello, I'm Sarah Brooke, and I am originally from Canada. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is confusing. So I was born in Victoria on Vancouver Island, um, British Columbia. My father and his whole side of his family is Canadian. So I'm a Canadian citizen. That's right, to this day. Yeah, yeah. But my mom is from California, born and raised. And then her whole side of the family is from California, specifically Northern California. Um, so I kind of have both. I have one side Canadian and one side California, and I went back and forth my whole life, but I, I grew up in California, but in Northern California, in Humboldt County, to be exact, which is super North. And then what brought you to Los Angeles then? When I was 18, I moved there. Hmm. Yeah. I went to high school and stuff in Humboldt and, you know, grew up there in the Redwoods just like in a really rural, I think my, the town was 10,000 people, maybe less. So that's but, kind of where the love of the outdoors comes from? Yeah, it's super, super rural up there. Mm. Like I think it's like four, five hours north of San Francisco on the coast. Um, the way you get there is literally like a two lane highway from, from San Francisco up and there's that's the closest big city is like five hours away. Are you, do you have siblings? I do. I have a lot of siblings <laughs> and it's all, we're all, um, like I have one full sister where we have both mom and dad. I have a half sister where we have the same dad, different moms. I have um, brothers that are adopted step brothers sort of mm -hmm. um it's hard to explain <laughs> i have two brothers so yeah. what was your first kind of artistic uh interest well i come from a family of artists so my great my grandmother is a painter and mm. she went to art school in detroit um and then my dad is an artist and sort of like all of my cousins are artists and my uncles. Um, I just grew up in a really eccentric, artistic, expressive family. So my first sort of like wanting to do art, really I cannot remember because I think it just was a natural state of being in my family. So you just were that way. That was the normal. Yeah, definitely. What kind of stuff did your grandma paint? She painted portraiture and still life. And it's beautiful. I mean, she's so talented. She was so talented. Um, I remember her painting like portraits of me and my sister when we were like five years old. I didn't understand how special that was until I got older and I can now look at the paintings that she painted of us. Um, but yeah, so I grew up with artistry just as a normal day. Mm. That's what you did. Yeah. The painting of you is not only a time capsule of you and your sister when yeah. you were that age, but it's also kind of, 
shown through the lens of your grandmother's yeah. eye as well as her hand and her yeah. ability to turn that into something. Yeah, it's really cool. And I didn't understand um, how special that was to have until I sort of like got out into the world as, an, as a young adult. And I was like, wait, oh, so most people don't have that at all. Because Humboldt County just in itself, I mean, I don't know if you know anything about Humboldt County. It is such a weird, eccentric place in itself. It is filled with, like, artists and bizarre people. Is there, like, a an industry, like, a big industry there? No, there's nothing mm. there. Mm. It's it. I think it's because there's nothing there that that's what people do. But it, there's like, it's kind of like one of those things, like there's something in the water. <laughs> it's just like everybody is super creative and expressive and... Is it a commuter city that people are going somewhere no, from there? not at all. It's just like isolated little... Super isolated. Mountain town and... Yeah, coastal mountain town. and But like also, it's a, it's a county, so it's, but it's really tiny county, so it's like kind of... All this, all the little towns in that county, everybody knows each other, you know, because like if you go to high school in one of the little towns, you play sports with the other little towns and that's who you're around all the time, you know. So it's like this really, I mean, even to this day, I'm like where I grew up was so weird compared to anywhere else I've ever been. So when you were 18, you were like, I need to get out of here? Yeah, I think that I just went through like a lot with my family and um, growing up in that community was great. I grew up with my dad too, so I did sort of like, you know, went to high school, went to school year with my mom and then would go summers type of thing with my dad. But my dad lives on a commune <laughs> in Canada. So I think it's like 800 acres of Canadian wilderness and it's just there was a community there and an intentional community that was created, I don't know, back in the 70s I think it was created. Um my dad lives I he still lives there. But there's no running water no modern amenities um and when i say no modern amenities i mean like cable there are no computers there's no cell phones there's no like do they get mail they do but it's like you have to go to the 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 post you don't get mail there you have to go to the post office Once a week you know or yeah and so that's your only contact with them like when you're there no like you have to write him letters oh he has a landline <laughs> So I can call him on the landline, but that's all he's got. He doesn't have FaceTime or computer to like look at. You can't email him photos or. Anything. Is he happy? Yeah, he is. Like if you asked him to leave there, he would be like, "Hell no, never, never will I leave here." It is like the best feeling when the few times I get to like turn off my phone mm -hmm. for like a weekend, mm -hmm. or I'm actually going to up in way up in the sticks in New York yeah. next week and my phone's gonna be off for like seven days straight yeah so I'll have client calls and I know it's so trippy right it's and you forget like how well because you and I grew up and you know we didn't have phones attached to our hands most of our you know childhood um but now it's like it, it it feels like it's attached to your hand at all times. It's really terrifying. <laughs> Something we talk about a lot on this podcast is like the the amount of amount of content you consume versus yeah. what you create. Uh -huh. And I have like this, and a lot of artists have this like need mm. to like I've been doing too much of social media or yeah. the news or whatever. So like now I need to like write a poem or a song yeah. or and you're a musician too uh, i am yeah yeah um what do you do i play stringed instruments so i mean i started playing guitar but you know when you play strings you can kind of get the flow in between and your voice is beautiful thank you yeah i only heard you sing one time but really mm -hmm. 
my so my family is all musicians. That's another thing that they possess that was very normal in my family is that every single person plays an instrument and is a musician. I mean, like true family band style. Oh my gosh! Like every single person, all my cousins, all my uncles, like my dad, our friends. Um, so when we would have like dinner. We didn't have TV, so we would play music. Like, we, we'd have family dinner, and then we would play music. That was, like, what we did with each other um, in our free time. If somebody sat down next to you, then that person would pick up an instrument, and the other person would pick up an instrument. You'd be like, what do you want to play? I don't know. Just play something, and you would just play music. Um, but my cousins play like fiddles, I mean, like ukuleles, mandolins, guitars, slide, like er- tons of different types of instruments too. So it would really be extremely fun. But it's so it's so weird when you grow up in that and you don't understand that it's not the norm. Because really when not. I take people to my family's house and they're like, let's, you know, let's make a vegan dinner and then we're all going to sit around and play music. And there'll be like 10 people, 15 people deep with instruments and they all sing too. And people are just like, this is like insane. <laughs> this is like another world. But to us, it was just like what you did. I imagine that's like, you have some pretty strong bonds with some mm-hmm. of your family? I mean, I do, but a lot of my family is estranged, too, which is really um, weird. Too much, too much proximity? Yeah, I think because everybody's really eccentric and, like, everybody's extremely unique. And it's really hard to sort of, you know, a lot of people in my family sort of just make up their own realities, which is great, but also difficult to deal with at times in the shared reality yeah because there's a common reality that everybody has that you're supposed to like abide by right because you're have to sort of maintain this social i don't know persona and if you if you sort of can't manage that you can be hard to get along with is conforming to the common reality selling out is that is I mean, that is that sacrificing artistic integrity i don't think so because in my family i 100 percent would be the m- most conformist person which if you looked at me from like an outside i probably don't seem like a conformist whatsoever so you can like imagine how non-conforming my family is if i look like the goody two shoes or the sellout or the <laughs> like that's me so um it's strange because it just it it's what you value you know do you value business uh money um you know, being comfortable, being able to sort of weave in and out of society. Most of my family doesn't, they don't, that doesn't hold value for them, which is fine, but it does hold some value for me. And I think as artists, you're sort of taught to like not value that thing, you know, not value material, money, business. Um, But I have a sort of different outlook on it because I have to place, if I want to attain what I want, there has to be some type of value on those types of things. And I don't see it as negative. For your, as your own motivator, you mean? Um, Not as a motivator, more as a way to get through life. Mm. You know, Mm. these are your stepping stones. Do you use them or do you toss them, toss them to the side and say, I don't, I don't use those stepping stones. I use my own stepping stones. (laughs) You know, I'm, I'm more like I can somehow bridge the two, which is different than most people in my family. Um, but you know, I've been accused of being, (laughs) what did my, my dad has definitely told me I was a, 
what words did he use? He's like the man, you know, he's used the words like the man or the <laughs> The suit. A suit. Yeah, yeah. I get that. Working yeah. for him, working for the man or being, you know. Well, I I, I got a job at the skate park mm-hmm. um because I wanted to get paid to like be around skateboarders and the second i put on the uniform i was the suit i was like oh i'm one of you guys i'm not like gonna (laughs) you know yell at you or whatever but like it's interesting that like as soon as i put on the uniform Mm -hmm. i wasn't a skateboarder anymore yeah i mean it's a really weird thing because it's like a lot of artists want to have a good business or a an, an ability to make money so they can then continue their art but then they sh- it's like a negative thing to talk about it's a negative thing to want it's a negative thing to be around and i just don't really think that way and so i think that that's why i'm so different than my family and and i don't think i'm a conformist at all but um I think I'm smart. (laughs) So that's like, you know, I think I somehow, I don't know if I was born with it or if it was just something that I under started to understand and nurture, but I understood that I somehow possessed, um, a business mind too. And I didn't, you know, um, you know, who's a really great example of that. Who's an artist is Frank Zappa. He has so Mm. many great things that he says about, you know, business and being smart about your money and being sp- smart about how you spend your time and and what you're learning and, you know, what you're consuming. And it's like this manifestation that sometimes the self-sabotage of creatives that say, I'm not good with money or I'm not good at business. Um, I need someone to do it for me. So part of this podcast is that when you mm-hmm. graduate from art school, yeah, they just teach you the the medium. Mm-hmm. They don't teach you all that stuff. Yeah, and which is simple as like taxes, mm-hmm. health insurance, yeah, invoicing. You know, like yeah. just all that little stuff. Yeah. Um, and also I was going to say about Zappa, no one can accuse him of not being an artist in his oh my medium because like, never. He's, I yeah. mean, how could you ever? He's one of the most creative, eccentric innovative artist Ta- there's ever been talented naturally yeah. yeah insane so ryan lawrence is my boyfriend um i use the term boyfriend but we've been together for like i don't know <laughs> nine years or something and business partner and business partner um and we run the stables together we do renovations together we you know basically just our whole lives is working and we're also partners so partners in work and partners in art and business so where were y'all at and what year was this and where were you at in your life when you were living in los angeles Mm -hmm. and you're like we want to mix things up and you ended up in savannah somehow so kind of talk me through that yeah um well we were both living in la when we met he was living in la and i was living in la we actually met through a a friend um, her name's Annie Priest. She's a great artist too, but she's like, you know, I was at her house and Ryan was, I don't even know, he was being a maniac over there and I met him and then we ended up dating, but we were living in LA. Um, I unfortunately was going through a crazy divorce, (laughs) which was insane. Um, I had to, make a decision about what I wanted to do because I was living in a city that I had only moved to because uh, I was married. Um, I had lived there for a long time, but it wasn't like I, it was his city. It was not my city. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I come from Northern California. I come from definitely a smaller, like country vibe. I lived in a city because I worked in the city and I, um, you know, needed to do that as a younger person. But as I became a professional artist, I could really just live anywhere. Um, so Ryan and I, I was like, I think I'm gonna sell my house. You know, I, I don't know, like, I don't wanna live here forever. It's not, doesn't really serve me anymore. I can go wherever I want. So 
Ryan and I just made a decision like I was going to sell my house and we ended up buying um, a huge RV and we lived in the RV and traveled around the United States for six months. It's awesome. Yeah. And we had our dogs and we were like, we're just going to travel around and figure out where we want to live. Um, because California, I mean, I love California. I'll always have love for California, but it's just, it's so expensive. It's insane. Um, and you go other places and you're like, I could like live here and be sort of like comfortable and not stress out every single day about how I'm going to pay for gas or healthcare or just normal types of things. So we wanted to move somewhere that checked off certain boxes, um, just like affordability, a community, um, sort of prettiness, aesthetically pleasing, and people are nice. And there's a lot of places in the US. I actually have traveled to the US a lot. Like I've been to every state. I've been every, I've been through the US so much. So I feel like I know a lot of it. I, I know a lot about it, but um, we went to, we had these certain cities that everybody loves, like these cities. They're like, these are the best cities in the US. And so we're like, okay, we're gonna travel around and just look at them and see if we can. See ourselves there. Yeah, just see if we like them. So we go to Austin, you know, we go to Santa Fe, we go to Sedona, we go to Nashville, we go to Boulder. Detroit. We didn't actually do much of Colorado because Colorado is very California to me in a way. <laughs> it is now, yeah. Yep. Um, but we we did these, you know, these cities that were considered cool and maybe places that people wanted to go to. We didn't actually even go to Savannah. And every place we went, there was something about it I didn't like like it whether it be it's not you know because I've n actually never not lived on the coast I've always lived on the coast you know I lived in Northern California on the coast I lived in LA it's, or in Long Beach which is on the coast um so when I got inland I'm like I don't know if I could do this I've never not lived by an ocean hmm. and then there were just little things like Santa Fe is beautiful but there's no trees which is weird when you grow up in a place that's the most beautiful trees in the entire world, the redwoods. Um, I was like, I, don't, I can't do that. No trees, that's weird. Um, Nashville was, I like Nashville, but it's just like kind of a sprawling city. It, it, in a way, it reminds me of Los Angeles because it's just like, it's very sprawling. It doesn't feel like there's like a city center and then it kind of a down, t it's very weird to me. Um, I love Detroit, actually. We spent a month in Pontiac, and it's like, Michigan is so gorgeous, and people just really don't realize that. It's it's incredible, but it snows, and I'm like, I don't know if I could do a winter here. So there were just like these drawbacks to each place we went. So we go back to California, and we're living in Northern California. We get a place in Northern California, and we're like, we're just going to live up here. And we're in Placerville, which is a little bit out of Tahoe. So in that sort of area. Mm -hmm. um, and we're there for 18 months. And in the 18 months, like we were living, California can get very desolate. You know, like if once you go up into the mountains, you're like by yourself. There is nobody there. So, and you had to drive pretty far to get to, to civilization. Um, so we're just like up in the mountains and I'm like 18 months in and I'm like, I don't even have like one friend here. <laughs> is, this, is this sustainable? Can I have no friends ever? Like every time I had to see friends, I had to have my friends come up from LA. Um, I don't know, it was really isolated and just, I think I was like, I don't know if I could do the no people thing for the rest of my life. So 
Ryan and I, and Ryan agreed. He was like, I don't know if I, you know, he was like driving like hours to commute to go places because that's just the way it is up there. Um, so we had a horse, but it was such a beautiful place. We had a horse, we had like five horses. We had, we had like five acres of land. It was a gorgeous dream life mm-hmm. that was not sustainable. But then there was like wildfires and it's just expensive. And I was like, well, what if we go check out Savannah, Georgia? And Ryan's like, what? And I'm like, I read a book. <laughs> So I read Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, which is a book everybody reads and loves because it's so great. And then I looked at photos of Savannah. I had never been here. I looked at photos and I was like, let's just fly out there and look at it. So we fly out for five days. We stay at an Airbnb in the historic district on Lincoln and Hall, which is an incredible area. If you are a Savannian, you know that's an amazing spot. We stay in this like mansion that was built in 1890 or 1860 or something, and it's all original and it's, you know, gorgeous. This is like 2017, 2016? 2016. Okay. Yeah. And our Airbnb host was this guy named Andrew, who is eccentric amazing wonderful person and he was like welcome to savannah and then just did the whole thing that everybody does here where they're like let me introduce you to my friends and this is the next door neighbor and here's the person that works at the store and then go to that coffee shop and that's azara and like we're just like what how does everybody know each other and they're so nice yeah (laughs) Yeah. pulling you in and Mm -hmm. you're just visiting yeah, we're like here for five days. We felt like we like made 20 friends. They're like, oh, come over to our house. We're gonna have a barbecue. We're gonna be in the backyard. And we're like, what is this place? So we were here for five days and we looked at the real estate prices and was like, this is ridiculous. Like, how does everybody not know about this place? Cause it's on the coast and it checked off all the boxes it's on the coast, community, beautiful easy to get around has a like city center that then spans out so you know you know you know you're downtown you know where you are um it's manageable the size is very manageable it's not so big that you're just like i don't know if i'll ever meet anybody here um and then everybody is so ridiculously nice and kind that we're like why would we not move here how would you not, if you if you ever came to Savannah, you're like, how would anybody be unhappy there? So we just like went back to Cali, picked up our stuff and came out here. Our Airbnb host was so sweet. He was like, oh, you guys want to move here? I have an apartment downstairs. And we're like, what? We get to live in this 1860 mansion? And he's like, yeah. And we're like, do you need to like run our credit? We need to fill out application. He's like, no just are you guys coming back we're like yeah and he's like okay cool just let me know and i'm like what (laughs) this guy trusts us and we just went we went got our stuff and came back um and uh ryan's ryan's talked about that Mm -hmm. that jersey uh you know that kind of the face he gives (laughs) it's like yeah where he looks like he's gonna like rip your head off (laughs) yeah and then the thing i hear about specifically angelinos is like there's a niceness but it's like a fake niceness oh yeah it's the worst and when you're here it's like how how are you today ma'am and you're like or sir and i and you're like i'm i'm doing good how are you it's like what do you want (laughs) you're just like genuinely curious about i came from a small town so i'm like more used to that that, yeah but i did live in la for 20 years and so i did grow used to i mean i had a lot of really great friends in la because i lived there for so long and i lived there during a period of my life where you grow up you know from like 19 years old until you know i lived there forever so i was i really grew up with the people that i was around um but those people the only reason why they became so close to me is because i was I was a um, professional dancer, and when you are in that type of situation, it's like being on a sports team. It's like being on a, 
you know, you're around them 24 seven, you rehearse with them, you practice with them, you are sitting on tours with them, you are spending the night with them in hotel rooms, you are sleeping in the same bed with them, sharing their clothes, sharing their stuff. So you're, you're like, there's no separate, you're them, they're you mm. type of thing. And so you just are close, you're like sisters, you know? And so if I didn't have that, there's no way I would even have one friend in Los Angeles that I still talk to. Mm. Because everybody's so transient with their kindness. It's like, they're really out to just get to, something they need. Yeah. And then if you can't provide that, they just are on to the next person. And it's super weird. And then here, it's kind of more just like, people have all the time in the world to stop I, and talk to you well and i think it's not the industry because when you work right. with people in the industry they're constantly looking at you to benefit them mm -hmm. and if you can't do that then they're just like i can't waste my time with you i'm on to the next person that can like get me where i want to go whereas here people are just normal they're not trying to like climb a ladder they're just like being them nor their normal selves like hello i'm you know sally i live two doors down and you're like she's not trying to like use me to like be on television or <laughs> or be whatever like she just actually lives two doors down and wants a friend and is like hey yeah <laughs> like want to hang out go for a walk and you're like sure let's do that like there's no exchange of I don't know. There's no manipulation to like use a person for something, mm -hmm. which is almost every single relationship in Los Angeles, in my opinion, if you work in the industry. I don't know if, what it's like to not work in the industry. So, mm -hmm. so when you got here, and there is an art community, there mm -hmm. is um, SCAD. Yeah. And um, so a lot of young artists, in the, probably in the last couple decades, mm -hmm. but you, you all saw a need for kind of co-working space. Yeah, because well, I was when I was in LA, I had a warehouse. I rented a space from a friend who owned a warehouse and he didn't even have it sectioned like the studios. We just taped spaces off. Like I just had, you know, he's like, how much do you want? I was like, I don't know, 600 square feet. And he's like, okay, tape it off. So I'd tape off my little space. And in the tape, you could do, you could put up shelves or curtains or whatever you want to do, or you could just have it open. And that was where I painted. So when I got here, it was like, and then in, in Northern California, I had a barn. So I had a studio and I had a, I had a studio in the barn, which was amazing. But when I got here, I was like, where the hell do people work? And everybody's like, you work in your house. I'm like, there is no way I can work in my house ever. Like I have not worked in my house in so long. And that, I mean, you and I can have a conversation about why that is, but I don't think it's beneficial for artists to work in their house. I just think that you need it. If you're a professional artist, you should have a, a studio space. Why is that? <laughs> I agree because I yeah. obviously here because ten it, minutes from my house because it sets a tone, it sets a level, it sets a, um, it sets a goal in your life that if you do not perform and go there and do the work, like you know, you know it's not going to happen. So you have to set up a routine. You have to get up. You have to go to your studio. You have to make it work because you're paying money for it. And if you want to be a professional artist, um, it should be a priority, mm. in my opinion. You know, a lot of people, I hear like people, I can't afford it or I can't, um, you know, and it's like, if you, studios are not that expensive. If you want to be a professional artist, you will make it work. Um, part of the, one of my goals of, uh, we can cut some of this if we mm -hmm. need to, mm -hmm. part of it is for artists to, 
if you do have a full time job and mm-hmm. you're just making art on the side, that's mm-hmm. fine too. Yeah, we're yeah, not, totally. We're not, sh- we're not shaming people. No, 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 not you know, at all. You know, if you're not a full time artist, you're oh, still. Oh, we've all an been there. Yes, yeah, for yeah. sure. So um, I wasn't a full time artist until I was not a professional dancer because I couldn't. You know, I had to like uh, transition it because I made most of my money being a dancer, so. I could only do art on the side. I didn't have time to do it full time, but I was still an artist. I mean, I've been an artist since I was born, but, um, but then I was like, you know what? I'm going to make this my job. I'm going to make this what I do. And then I made it happen. You know, like, that's what I mean. Hmm. Um, It's sometimes it's hard to talk about art without you know because like Nathan's art, Nate's mm-hmm. art for yeah, for yeah, example, yeah, yeah. you know you you want to like describe it to people, but you mm-hmm. also don't want to put it in a in a in a box mm-hmm. or whatever. So did you ever start painting kind of still lifes or portraits or oh, anything yeah, like that? Yeah, I painted you? everything. Yeah, and then yeah. how did you kind of what do you do now? What do you focus on now? I do large abstracts. And how'd you get there? Um, I've just always been drawn to abstracts, but. I actually didn't know how to do them. It was easier for me to paint a portrait. I love your work. Just want to put that on the record. Thank you. And I will have one upstairs someday. (laughs) I love that. It was easier for me to paint an object Mm -hmm. because I knew what I was painting. And there was an end and a beginning. um, And there was a palette that was already there that I followed when I first started like saying, you know, I'm going to do this for a job. Um, then I, I've always loved abstracts always since I was, you know, I can't even remember going to the first, you know, art show or museum I've ever went to. I was always the abstracts. I would just make a beeline for the abstracts because that's just what I love to look at. Um, but there, I mean, I find them more, a lot of people are like, oh, my, my kid could do that, or whatever, whatever people say. It's like ridiculous. Your kid can't do that because your kid isn't hindered by um, life yet. <laughs> so that's sort of my stance on abstracts. Um, it is hard to paint an abstract, in my opinion, because there's no rules, there's no end. You can keep going forever, and you have to choose to make a decision to stop and you have to make a decision to create something that doesn't exist how do you know when you're done i mean sometimes i don't and sometimes i fuck it up (laughs) and go too far and then i'm like okay i just ruined that one great um i think it just comes with time and experience you like figure out your own little vibe and like what you see like what you like to see and then you know like okay this is good I've done enough. This is done. How does how does your mood or your what you're feeling affect what you're painting on that particular day? Or do you go mm-hmm. into it just knowing what you want and then you just no, no regardless of your mood, does it do you stick to that plan or I don't ever know what I want to paint. I sometimes have color palettes that I know I want to work with. Um mm-hmm. there's never like I'm like this is what I'm painting today. It's more like, okay, this are, these are the materials that I want to use today. I want to do a really textury piece. So I'm going to, you know, work with the plasters and the gessos and stuff. Or maybe I just want to do a really clean, flat piece that's just smooth and clean. Um, I, my mood doesn't really affect my art, which is weird. I used to think, I used to subscribe to the, I need to be tortured to create great art, but I don't subscribe to that whatsoever. I actually create better art when I'm not tortured than I ever did when I was tortured. That comes up a lot on this show. Yeah, like I don't want to be in that headspace ever again. So I just, it's not even something that I think about. Most of the time when I'm painting them in a wonderful, great mood um, and I'm grateful, I feel gratitude that I'm able to do this. 
So I don't come at it from like an emotional stance of like um, tortured emotional stance. Um, let's also touch on, and we will talk more in mm -hmm. an upcoming episode more okay. about the stables and what the stables yeah, has yeah. to offer. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm upstairs, I'll get you yes. and Ryan both down, and we'll do one just specifically. And if you hear Holy clunking around, <laughs> it's because they're actually working on my space <laughs> upstairs. Oh my gosh. So, uh, but um, but just like a quick plug for the stables, there are mm -hmm. spaces available if you're an artist in Savannah mm -hmm. looking for a studio space. You can get a hold of uh, Ryan or Sarah yeah. and um, the stables com. I think, yeah, I think either my numbers on there or Ryan's. I think Ryan's numbers might be on there. You can Google the stables or e or Gmail. Sta the stables Savannah at Gmail com. Okay. StableSavannah at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. And then um, we also do regular markets, outdoor markets, which are kind of like trade, like. Um, Makers markets. Makers markets, mm -hmm. yes. So uh, different Creative artists, markets. not only that mm -hmm. are located here, but also just in the community will come mm -hmm. here. You can walk around, you can have yeah. drinks, have food. Um, and then. Stuff like um, shows, concerts, movie nights. There's we're gonna be reopening the gallery pretty yeah. soon, so we'll 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 go more into detail about all that and kind of the community that they've cultivated here in an upcoming episode. But I also wanted to touch on a little bit. We'll just plug a little bit about explain what Kinky News is. Oh yeah. And then also your draw to go into real estate. Oh yes. Kinky Nudes first. Kinky Nudes. Kinky Nudes is so cute. Um, it was a sign that was accidentally made so i had a sign like an actual metal sign that said kinky and i had it sitting i don't uh, like on a bench or something and then i had made ryan had made a sign that said nudes because his artwork is a lot of um wordage so he'll do you know he does his, his wood art and he does like a lot of different words in the, his art and one of the pieces that he had done said nudes which I thought was so cute and I have it before it became like really I don't now I see it all the time because I don't know whatever we can figure that out later <laughs> but we'll say he set the trend yeah there was a I had a piece in my bathroom above our clawfoot tub that said nudes a piece of his art um and now I see it all the time but I had taken that piece and then I put kinky next to it because I had the two signs and then we had started the stables and I had this little store because I love vintage, I love collecting just weird cool pieces of stuff. Um, and I had this little store inside the stables. So when we did our art shows, we did our gallery shows, there was a little store that had merch in it. It had vintage, it had cool pieces in it. Um, and I said, I'm just gonna name it Kinky Nudes because we already have this sign that says Kinky Nudes. And then also it's no um, secret that I love Western <laughs> everything. So, there's like these old Western suits called nudie suits, and they are mm. the traditional, you know, when you see the like, the cutouts, the um, applique style Western suits with like snakes and diamonds and horses and lassos and like on the, the suits and they're just like completely tailored, but they're called nudie suits and they're incredible. So it was kind of like this homage to the nudie suits, kinky nudes, it's Western, it's at the stables. It, that was my play on it. Cool. And yeah. uh, stuff's still available even though we don't have the shop. It is. And I'm just revamping it. We sort of like COVID just, you know, COVID just to everybody. It just threw this whole wrench in the system of like how you were doing things and the, the way that you were going and stuff. And sort of I had to reconfigure our spaces um, to deal with COVID and then the shop got moved and then I don't know, but it's being revamped. So cool. And then what, um, I mean, perfect town for it, but what mm -hmm. was your draw to get into real estate? I mean, I've always done real estate on the buyer seller side mm -hmm. because I 
just love renovations. I love homes. I, I just love interior, interior design. It comes with the art. Um, just making things aesthetically pleasing. Going to the flea market. Yeah, I'm just a collector of weird stuff. I mean, I probably get it from my dad. He has so much cool thing. Like, his house is ridiculous. The stuff that he collects is ridiculous. I think he has a whole wall of... He collects strange things like paint by numbers the last supper so he has paintings of the last supper and they're all paint by numbers that he's found and he has an entire gallery wall like a whole wall with the last supper paintings so just like (laughs) they're just like really weird stuff or he has a bunch of he likes velvet paintings too so he has like a whole wall of like velvet paintings that he's collected um but I probably get some of that from him. So he loves just finding cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's obviously a good time to sell a house right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. I just jumped into it. I had done, so I had bought and sold some houses in Los Angeles. And then when, when we had got to Savannah, I had bought some abandoned, like, horribly dilapidated rundown houses here and we renovated them and I sold I did vacation rentals in them and then I sold one and we live in one we do a vacation rental still um but I just love doing that and somehow I'm good at it like doing the project managing and figuring out you know how everything goes and Probably because I've been with Ryan for so long, I'm like sort of a novice construction worker too. <laughs> mm-hmm. I can like figure out, you know, how to do things. So, do you attract a certain? Because um, I wouldn't say you're traditional Savannah. Yeah, right. <laughs> do you do you tr- attract certain kind of uh, clients that you work? Yeah, in? I do, and I'm trying to like build that niche because, you know, as a self-employed person, getting a loan is extremely hard Mm. because your employees are more likely to get a loan than you are, which Mm -hmm. is bizarre, but it is the truth. Um, So I attract a lot of like the creative crowd or people that are self-employed and they either didn't think that they would ever be able to get a loan to get a house or they just don't know how to go about doing it. They don't know who to ask. or people that are interested in doing fixer uppers and like renovating places or possibly having passive income and getting like, you know, rentals that they can slowly collect. So they just have rental income coming in every month. So they could be an artist or they can be a musician or they, you know, they have another income. So they don't have to worry if they don't, you know, produce something with their art that month. Which is, I think, extremely smart to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, and someday I'll be tapping you in, right? Because uh, yeah, that's part of why I'm with here, just because like the mm-hmm. the houses is the housing market is, um, you can find stuff that's old, and you kind of yeah. have to adhere to the his, you know the historic yeah, preservation. Yeah. It's part of the culture here. Mm-hmm. Um. We have something that we haven't done in past episodes very much, mm-hmm. which is we have some user submitted questions. Love it. So, um, w- the first question is Do you wake up in the middle of the night and write down your ideas mm-hmm. when they come to you? Or, how do, like, what's that process look like? I actually do write down ideas. Not in the middle of the night, though, but I do dream about them. And then in the morning, I have this little routine, which is a little bit psychotic, but um, I wake up every single morning and I do a journal. Mm -hmm. I journal for 15 minutes. I try to do like three pages. Wow. Yeah. And I do it every single morning and I've done it for years and years. Like I have like stacks of journals that are just filled with what ideas, thoughts, problems, gratitude. Um, 
but I do write stuff down a lot. So it, I'll go back to them um, sometimes if I don't remember, you know, like what I wanted to accomplish. But yeah, it's definitely writing things down is extremely important for my process just in life in general. Do you, when you're writing down, de- how personal do you get? Super personal? Oh, yeah. Like, if somebody read my journal, they'd be like, this is, this person's crazy. Are you sometimes paranoid about that? No. Someday will, someday no. somebody will read this? I don't care. Because, you know, I took this journaling class. It changed my mind. It changed my whole perspective on journaling. I took a journaling class at UCLA. It was just a class that you could sign up for and go to. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go take this class because it just sounds really cool. So when I I signed up for it and I took it, it was like a six-week class or something. And the woman specifically taught journaling. And I know it sounds like something you don't need to learn about. But the perspective that she gave me on it was so important for my creative process because she made me understand good writers Mm. she made me understand what happens in the process of good writing and like a journal is just a different reality you know you're just writing down a reality that that's happening at that day it doesn't mean that it's real you know you don't or permanent yeah it's not permanent it's not real it's not it's something that you just are feeling and then you get it out, you write it out, whether it be good or bad or crazy or who even knows. But that was a question that came up a lot in the class. Do you feel embarrassed? You know, would you feel embarrassed if somebody read your journals? And she was like, no, I would be proud of them because they're, they're the reality that I was feeling at that moment whether it be right or I mean everybody feels things that would be considered wrong or (laughs) not okay but you're just like doing it in this healthy manner you're writing it down in a book that you're not showing anybody it's not like it's there for people to like you know be manipulated by or coerced by or something so if you're having a negative feeling or whatever you're writing down seems negative you move on like I don't I mean, I don't even know what I wrote three years ago or seven years ago or 10 years ago. Like, who even knows? I was a different person. But it's cool to, like, have that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be embarrassed. I mean, I'm sure if anything, people would relate to it and be like, oh, damn, I probably thought that too or, (laughs) you know. Do you write it in a very linear storytelling way or can it be sometimes nonsensical? Nonsensical. It can be anything. Hmm. There's no, like, rule or... I have one friend that's journaled for over 10 years yeah. and he'll be like, yeah, on this day, we, this is when you came to see me. And, and I'm like, that's so cool that yeah. you have like a catalog of your that's life. That's very like David Sedaris. He does a lot of journaling and he's like, he has actually like a book of his journals, but it's very much like organized thought process. Mm. Mine is definitely not like that. Mm. Yeah. I think I overthink it. I would like to mm-hmm. do it someday, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm worried. I'm always thinking about what if somebody reads this? I don't know. I don't, I don't even care. So, it's like, what are you? What are you gonna say? Like, what? I was an asshole three years ago. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> Look yeah. at me now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um. What's What's one of your most simple pleasures in life? Um. This is another user submitted question. I know. By the way. Oh my gosh, I have so many. I'm gonna be so cheesy right now and just say like nature. <laughs> because that is my most that is what I need most of Mm. to even understand and process this world Um, if I don't have that I'm just like I don't even know what to do that's when the depression gets real crazy I, I say things like I need nature I need to be in nature like I need to go to nature I'm gonna fucking freak out <laughs> so it is like what I love more than anything mm. like I'm just one of those people that if you could just like if I could just go sit in a field or sit in a forest or be out in the trees or the beach or take a walk somewhere that's like the best thing 
Yeah, and then, but you still feed off people too, so it's kind of like that balance mm-hmm. a little bit. Yeah, definitely, there has to be a balance. Um, this is an interesting one that somebody else asked. Do you mm-hmm. do you tend to recognize undeveloped talent, and if so, um, are you cult- trying to cultivate it in a way? That is such a. Qu- I love that question mm-hmm. because. Yes, I do, and it's not good sometimes because most people do not follow their talent. So I have done this a lot in my past, and I really had to step back and say... Construction noises, sorry about that. Yeah, Ryan. (laughs) Um, I have done, like, I have seen a lot of undeveloped talent in a lot of people and I'm drawn to it, I'm sort of like magnetized to it, and then I have this, I don't even know what it would be, this sort of caretaker-esque vibe where I wanna help you find that inside yourself and, and develop it and nurture it, but unfortunately, most people don't nurture their talent and that's the the cliche term wasted talent you know um but I end up getting like hurt (laughs) or disappointed or having some type of falling out with the person um because they're not doing what I think they should do to sort of better their lives with this what they wanted this talent that they want to have and I don't know. So I do, but I've I've stopped doing it because it's a little bit controlling. I mean, I don't mean for it to be controlling, but I've like recognized it now is like just because somebody has talent doesn't mean that they need you to sort of help them through it. And then also, I don't know. I I don't know if it's like my expectations are extremely high of people or something, but I always seem to get let down. So I have to like, even when I talk to people now and they're like, I have this great idea and I really want to make it work. And I'm like, oh my God, that's such an incredible idea. Let me help you do it. I, as soon as I think that thought, now I go, no, you need to not do that. (laughs) Yeah. Part of the challenge is like when people find a way to make money doing something they love, it sucks the fun out of it for them. And I can't help myself. I see, I have a business mind. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Oh, I enjoy this. Mm -hmm. So I try and coach people. And then I, I end up, I think I end up sucking the fun out of it for them. And they're like, just like (laughs) making them, yeah, if you if people think about it in a way that it just is like a job, then it kind of yeah. like takes the fun out of it for them. I could see that. Yeah. I think I just am like, if you don't do it this way, or if I go, uh, this is like, if you do it this way, it's not going to work. Mm. Where, whatever, like, who knows? Maybe it will work for them in a way that I don't even know, you know? I don't know. Or so they have I, to try it at least. Yeah, like... <laughs> instead of me being like no it has to be done this way in order for it to be this successful if you want to be this successful you have to do it this way like um i mean i think it's more of attraction not promotion Mm. like i will do my thing and hopefully people see lead by example yeah see it they're attracted to it they're attracted to what I offer and if they're attracted to it then it just comes really easy and naturally rather than me promoting my ideas to get people to like use their talent in the right way Mm. (laughs) you know I don't know that's how I have sort of learned what advice would you give to a 17 year old version of yourself Mm. I mean, just like the normal type of cliche advice, like stop hating yourself. Stop thinking that you can't do anything. Um, I had a really difficult upbringing, so I had to go through a lot of really terrible things in order to get where I am now. And... In a, in a way, I'm sort of proud of the 17-year-old, 
that I was, I don't even know, she could probably give me more advice than me giving her in a sense because, you know, I don't, things have changed so much in the world. It's just so bizarre now sometimes to me. That's That's the one thing that I find in this as an artist and a creative, the way that the world has changed with technology is extremely difficult for me to deal with sometimes. Um, I get lost in and overwhelmed by, I don't know, the, the two worlds, like the real world and then the online world. And I don't, it's, it, they're extremely hard for me to navigate. Sometimes the online world is. The, re- the real world I do all right with, but online I find it extremely difficult sometimes just because I don't understand it. The ever-changing craziness of it. Yeah, it's almost like the sum of the like the some of the parts type thing too, where it's like uh, you mm-hmm. know, like the evil media is mm-hmm. really just like individual people that we know that yeah. live that are our neighbors and stuff, but collectively uh-huh. it creates it's, it's like really this weird. monster or you know social but media. But even like so, like social media. Um, I mean, I think I'm pretty good at it, but there's definitely this weird thing that you have to take into account is like you have to sort of navigate through it you can't just go balls to the wall like whatever the hell you want because something's gonna happen and you're just gonna get like slammed or who even knows what's gonna happen but there are too many variables to take into account for you to just be yourself which goes entirely against being an artist it's like the opposite of being an artist. So for me to navigate that, sometimes it's extremely difficult because you're like, I'm just going to be myself, but then, or I'm just going to express myself freely, whatever that is. And then you're like, oh yeah, we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to do that anymore. We have to do it in a weird curated way. So <laughs> it's like bizarre. It's bizarre to me because I've lived in such a free lifestyle and a free um, childhood to where you could just be whatever you wanted there was no like that's bad Mm -hmm. just be whatever Mm -hmm. figure it out if it's bad you'll learn why it's bad and then you'll figure it out but there was no like you you can't have to stop being that way like more just like you can be that way but then you'll see and you'll figure out why you can't be that way or you'll or you won't and you'll just you know it was like this freedom of expression to learn who you were and i don't know if that exists anymore do you think we're it's really sad in a bad direction or do you think we're i mean of- yeah i do but that's like super heavy and crazy but i do i mean i think with these younger kids and these younger artists that are now i mean if i could give any a 17 year old artist now sure advice would be to ignore all that shit and to just be yourself no matter if somebody hates you or thinks you're wrong or thinks you're bad or you have to be that to get to where you're gonna go you have to be yourself you cannot be a freaking curated version of yourself as an artist that's bizarre i don't care if somebody hates you that's a freaking artist how many artists are hated? A lot of them. Well, they say if, you're, if you don't have somebody hating, you're not doing anything. Yeah, or... like it's so weird to think that somehow you're going to figure life out and go through it perfectly. Like, what? what? Mm. <laughs> That's so... I don't even know. That's bizarre to me. Mm. Um, how can people learn more, mm-hmm. find out about you? Where can they follow you? Oh, on my social media. <laughs> Speaking of. Speaking of, yeah. Um, but so, only nice people. Yeah. At Sarah Brooke Sandin. Sarah with an H. Brooke with an E. Um, and then that's kind of all I do, really, is my Instagram. I don't have all the other... T- I mean, I do, but I don't really use them at all. And that's sort of all. I've been wanting to have you on for so long, so I'm glad we finally got yes. to sit down. Um, 
Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, again, if y'all have questions for Sarah, she is my uh, studio neighbor. Love so me. she'd love to uh, come back on sometime. I'm going to have Ryan on mm -hmm. to talk about his woodworking and construction. And I'm sure we'll touch on our mutual mm -hmm. back injuries at some yeah. point. And then uh, maybe we'll all sit down and talk about the stable. So. Uh, in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, I'm going to be talking to more artists, entrepreneurs, and creative professionals mm -hmm. to help discover their path to success. If you have episode feedback or guest suggestions, you can email me at wecreatetruth or gmail.com. If you're watching on YouTube, you could drop a comment below. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. If you're listening on iTunes, please leave me a good review. You can learn more at creative-truth.com. We have hats, apparel, mugs. Every little bit helps. I appreciate it, uh, your support, and uh, we will see you in the next, ep we'll, t we'll talk to you in the next episode. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs>